Good morning. The theme of my talk today is to try to understand the linkages between carbon in fluids and other important chemical elements, the rock-forming elements uh, in the deep earth. Understanding this linkage is going to lead, I believe, to one of the great challenges for the next years in deep carbon science. Before the Deep Carbon Observatory started, as many of you know, the typical picture of a fluid in the deep earth contained a bunch of simple molecules, uh, including water and various carbon molecules as shown uh, in the... in the top here. These are assumed to simply mix without uh, specifically through the uh, oxidation state of the system. Importantly, there are no other solutes in the system and no other ions in the fluid. In order to have ions in a fluid and to get variables like pH, which are important for reactivity of fluids, we need to understand how water molecules interact with ions. This is a solvation process, and that solvation process depends on a very important fundamental property of water, the dielectric constant of water. <clears throat> Shown here are results from a very important study by Ding Pan et al. published in, in 2013, um, where the dielectric constant of water was predicted from ab initio molecular dynamics at several different conditions and we can see that it correlates empirically with the logarithm of the density of water. Building on that correlation, we made predictions of the dielectric constant of water over a very wide range of pressures and temperatures so that we could then analyze experimental data. A key set of experimental data shown here are these beautiful Raman spectra showing bicarbonate and carbonate in an aqueous fluid in equilibrium with aragonite crystals um, collected by my colleague Isabel Danielle and co-workers uh, in Lyon. So these data for ions were crucial together with the vast body of work on aqueous species from the research of the late Harold Helgeson and Everett Schock and myself over decades for us to be able to extend these uh, characteristics to prediction of other, many other chemical uh, species. This enabled us to work on analyzing far more complicated but interesting geological fluids, such as those measured by Ronit Kessel and co-workers over a period of years. <clears throat> you can see one example here is a fluid in equilibrium with a mafic eclogite containing garnet, clinopyroxene, and coazite, and diamond. And I'm just showing the concentration of aqueous silica in moles per kilogram of water here but all the other chemical elements in the eclogite were measured as well. As a function of temperature, published by El Azar et al. 2019, you can see that by the time we get up to 1100 degrees C at 6 GPA, we are in what's called a supercritical fluid, which I like to call a supersolvus supercritical fluid, to emphasize that this fluid is beyond the stage of the separation of melt and fluid. It's above the solvus and it's just a continuous solubility curve, which contains, at this condition, only 25% water. There's about 25% silica by weight as a component, about 25% other solutes, sodium, potassium, magnesium, aluminum, and iron as components, and about 25 weight percent CO2. So this is quite a remarkable fluid uh, that is no longer subject to the classification of melt versus fluid. It's truly a supercritical fluid system. In addition, a major new development was the uh, recent paper in 2016 by Pan and Gali, study of, again, by ab initio molecular dynamics of sodium carbonate water fluids. And they showed that ions were incredibly important, as one might expect, bicarbonate and carbonate, but also a whole array of complexes of sodium and various carbon species. So these are, many of these species are not anticipated by studies from ambient conditions. 
So here we see that carbon is strongly linked to a major rock forming element. In addition, most surprisingly, was that carbon is also linked to water. So water plus CO2 gives the molecule H2CO3, which is carbonic acid. Carbonic acid, as you know, is totally unimportant as a molecule at ambient conditions uh, in uh, geochemical settings, except that it dissociates to bicarbonate and uh, H+. But in high-pressure fluids, it turns out that H2CO3 is indeed an important species and under certain conditions can be much more important than CO2. So now we have new linkages between uh, carbon and other species in the fluids. All of this uh, led to a, a great expansion of our ability to do geochemical modeling from the old regime here going up to 5 kilobars or 0.5 GPA and expanding up into this region of 6 GPA or 60 kilobars well into the upper mantle. As an example, um, we published in 2015 a new way that diamond could form by pH drop during reaction progress. So here is a, um, a fluid reacting with a carbonatitic fluid reacting with an ectogenic rock, and diamond forms shown in the red here as a function of reaction progress on the x-axis. This is the log moles of diamond on the y-axis. Diamond forms, then it goes back into solution a bit, so it gets resorbed and then it precipitates again. So we have multiple generations of diamond formed in the one reacting fluid, a single fluid reacting with one rock. We can have a whole array of chemistry, not only for the diamond, but also for the solid solutions of garnet and clinopyroxene. The same reaction progress is shown here to show that the bulk chemistry of the fluid on this diagram progresses from here in the black stars to here from start to finish with potassium plus sodium, calcium, magnesium, and iron, and aluminum silicon. And these black stars align reasonably well with a trend in worldwide fluid inclusion uh, analyses in diamonds that have been studied for decades and are really our primary evidence for fluids and water uh, in the deep earth. So this particular leg of this worldwide trend uh, has been modeled by prediction. I'm going to now show you uh, this trend along here, which goes from sodium potassium fluids that are very, very saline. They're essentially potassium chloride rich fluids uh, with extremely high concentrations of potassium chloride. So this is unpublished work yet by Fine preparation. You can see on the same diagram we have a fluid over here that is a saline fluid that is reacting uh, with a Hartsburgite containing a more carbonatitic fluid and you can see that the fluid chemistry evolves uh, from uh, saline to carbonatitic and the pH increases and the FO2 increases uh, because methane is getting oxidized at the site of diamond formation. So this is another way that uh, diamond forms. <clears throat> Under these conditions also, it's important to start looking at the kinds of mass transfer that supercritical supersolvers fluids could uh, participate in. So as part of the dew melts, uh, melts dew synthesis, working with Mark Chioso, um, we were able to show that uh, a fluid that I mentioned earlier, published by El Azar et al. this year, at 1100 degrees C, and um, at 6 GPA, in equilibrium with a mafic eclogite, garnet, clinopyroxene, and coazite, um, that has only 25 weight percent water in it, so it's well along the spectrum between water and rock here. This is a continuous solubility curve as a function of temperature, that fluids like this can now be modeled from a purely aqueous standpoint, uh, going from here all the way up through to here. And this is really rather a melt-like situation, but it is a truly supercritical fluid. Fluids like this are very powerful. Uh, they can absolutely overwhelm one rock and turn it into another rock. And that's because of the incredible amount of salt, of solute that's dissolved in these fluids. That becomes possible because of the linkages between carbon and other elements. Uh, 
shown here on the top left is a linkage between an aluminosilicate tetrahedron and a silicon tetrahedron. Uh, there is actually spectroscopic evidence for that at ambient conditions, and that explains a wide variety of uh, rock solubilities and high pressures and temperatures. Down here is a hypothetical aluminum tetrahedra surrounded by four silicate tetrahedra that may be uh, useful for certain uh, felsic systems. And in the rocks that I just showed you, the mafic eclogitic fluids, a key species complex is magnesium shown here and silicon shown here and carbon shown here. So this is a magnesium silicate bicarbonate complex that is responsible for transporting molar levels of magnesium in high pressure fluids. What do we know about species like this? So far, they've invent, they're invented to explain the solubility data that we have for fossil that is really a unique set of uh, solubility data, although it does extend over a wide range of chemistries, so it does give us confidence that we can explain with these complexes a wide range of chemistries. What we would like to have is spectroscopic data and spectroscopic studies and more ab initio studies um, to try to understand more about the kinds of complexes that might exist in these fluids. So let's look at that. Oh, <laughs> there's no data. This is actually a very serious problem because if we don't know the actual species in upper mantle fluids, we can't possibly address all these other very exciting big picture questions. How much of the upper mantle has been altered by fluids? How important are fluid rock interactions in the transition zone of the lower mantle? We've heard, some remarkable, heard about some remarkable studies uh, earlier uh, in the sessions about diamonds from the very deep earth containing all kinds of extraordinary inclusions. To what extent might deep fluids be involved in these diamonds, in their formation, and also in the inclusions inside them? And finally, the ultimate question I think that so many of us are interested in in the Deep Carbon Observatory is how does deep carbon make the conditions for life possible on Earth and, of course, on other planets, including exoplanets that are being discovered at such a rapid rate? So once we understand speciation in fluids in the deep Earth, we'll be able to address questions like this, and modeling will become then an important part of planetary exploration and plan ex the exploration for planetary habitability. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Fantastic talk and a great call to arms for the, for the next 10 years and the challenges ahead. Are there any questions before we go to coffee? Everyone needing a caffeine injection. So I guess uh, we will... Oh, there's a... Sorry. Mark. Super is this on? Yeah. It's super exciting to be able to go from a fluid to you know, basically a volatile rich melt continuously with a single thermodynamic model. Uh, I, I didn't think this was possible, you know, up until you showed it was possible. But it seems to me that going past that, what you're going from is from water to a melt that is essentially depolymerized. And you don't need to deal with polymerization. And going past that, there's going to be severe challenges that I think we need spectroscopy help to understand the chemistry of the polymerization so that we could get some continuous uh, f well, f continue further along that, uh, along that trend. It, 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 Thank you, Mark. Yeah, I, I couldn't agree more. My call for spectroscopic and ab initio uh, uh, calculations, spectroscopic data and ab initio calculations really applies to the whole spectrum. And that's what we need to try to see how far along we can go and, and to be able to make a model that will be applicable in general to many different kinds of planets. Thank you very much. So there are no further questions. I just appear the lights are a little, a little uh, harsh in the face to be able to pick people out. But um, I think we should we thank all the speakers in the session once more and uh, head to coffee.